uh, go ahead and, and uh, get involved in that process. So that's just a little additional piece of information there for everyone. Well, this morning uh, we'd like you to join us and open your Bibles uh, to the book of Acts. The book of Acts this morning. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, God lays on our hearts uh, as a pastor. He lays things on our hearts that uh, sometimes we don't know exactly why he's putting it on our hearts. And this is one of those Sundays. I don't know exactly why he wanted me to speak on this today. Uh, I think in time that may become clear as, as God uses his word. Uh, I don't know if it's maybe somebody here, maybe it's somebody that will be listening online, uh, but I know this, uh, clearly uh, God wants me to speak on what I'm going to speak on this morning. So uh, let's open our Bibles to Acts chapter 1, and we're going to just read a couple verses here this morning to get us started. I have a lot of scriptures today, so I hope you, uh, your fingers are nimble and you're ready to to charge through the scriptures, uh, and we'll enjoy that time together. <clears throat> Acts 1, verses 10 and 11. And while they, that is the disciples, looked steadfast toward heaven, as he went up, that's Jesus, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Father, I just pray that the challenge that you've laid on my heart today will be a challenge that we all embrace. I don't think there's anyone here this morning, and perhaps not even anyone listening, that haven't had their attention drawn in some measure to the fact that Jesus Christ could come back at any moment. We are living in unprecedented times. And so, as you have encouraged us in your word, we will live in anticipation of the soon coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you, Father. We thank you. You have made every provision for us that we can be prepared and ready when the Lord Jesus comes for his saints. We're anxious for that day. And thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I, I have been a pastor for a long time now. Uh, had chapel on Friday uh, with our Christian school. And that was number 45. Not the 45th chapter. The 45th year of having the first chapel uh, with our Christian school kids. What a blessing. The school is really doing well. And if you are ever kind of down and you're a little, uh, uh, you know, just kind of moping, I challenge you, you'd be welcome to come in here on a Friday and sit and see all these kids gather and, and be a part of the chapel services. Uh, it, is, it is a game changer for all of us. Every day that I come in here and see these kids walking in the hallway and the teachers and what a blessing that is. And I realize that over those 45 years, there have been many occasions when people have, there's been a buzz, you know what I'm saying? That there's been a, t a lot of talk about the, the circumstances and the times in which we are living. We have, for years, had a watch list that we've talked about of the scriptural things that indicate uh, or will happen before the Lord Jesus Christ returns. You know, one of those things that I said, oh, many years ago was, watch for the increase in, in uncurable diseases. You know, the Bible indicates that there are going to be those kind of things developing, and wow, we have just been living through that, haven't we? And we're not through that corridor yet, uh, I'll guarantee you that. So uh, we realize that these are really unprecedented times in many ways. And when the Lord ascended to heaven, his followers stood there like, wow, what's happening here? <laughs> and uh, the two angels appear and say, you know, why are you gaping in heaven? Why are you just, he's gone. And he's coming again in the same manner that he went, he will return. Well, listen, friends, I don't know when the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back. 
He didn't give me the exact day or date or hour. I don't suppose I'd tell you if I knew. <laughs> you know why? Because he surely wouldn't come that day. <laughs> he says, no man knows the day or the hour. That's, you hear somebody saying, I figured it out. I know exactly when the Lord's coming. You know, going, oh, yeah, right. Plan a, my, my old professor said, plan a picnic that day. Well, listen, I can tell you this. I have never in my 45 years heard more people, Christians and non-Christians, talking about what does all this mean? Is Jesus Christ coming again? Even those that don't know or understand much about this are talking about the days in which we are living. Amazing stuff, it really is. And I want to lay a challenge out before us today challenge to us as believers and for those that are listening that may not be certain of their eternal destiny this is not a time to be uncertain you understand that this is not a time to be uncertain about your eternal destiny because if you are you are playing a dangerous game because I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ could come even before I'm done speaking and everybody said yeah, I knew I'd get an amen on that one. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I say amen to that too. I say amen to that. And so, let's think a little bit about, first of all, three things that you need to understand. Three things that you need to know about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and being prepared. If I were to give this a title, it's Jesus is coming. Are you ready? Are you ready? Well, the first thing that I think people need to understand today, whether you're a believer or an unbeliever, is that He is coming and you will not be able to hide from the reality of His return. Now, how does that affect me as an individual? Well, as a believer, <clears throat> the challenge to my heart is I need to be living my life in such a way as to be obedient and pleasing to the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I don't want Him to come back and find me twiddling my thumbs and living disobediently. I don't want sin to be dominating my life as a Christian. I want to be living my life effectively, filled with the Spirit of God, and in rejoicing in, the, in each day that God gives me and the opportunities that are presented before me. You know... Uh, there's an interesting scripture. In fact, <clears throat> in studying for this and preparing, I found that it, it actually is one of those scriptures that starts in the Old Testament and then continues on through the New in, in a couple of different places. The, the first place that you find this indication is in Hosea. We're not going to turn to that one, but it's Hosea 10, 8. And uh, for those that want to turn to that, it's in the white pages of your Bible. You know, the minor prophets, you hardly ever get there, but that's what the professors used to call it, the white pages. But we are going to turn to Luke. Let's turn to Luke chapter 23. Now this scripture is talking of a day that is yet to come. Hosea first said this, and then in the Gospel of Luke it is repeated. And then we're going to look at its further explanation in the book of Revelation. It says that there's a day coming, in verse 30, Then shall they begin to say, To the mountains, fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. What a thing to say! asking the mountains and the rocks and the hills to fall upon them because they are, they are wanting to escape something. There's something so profound happening, something so amazing happening, and so fearful happening that they would rather be crushed by an avalanche than to see what's actually happening. What on earth could this be? Well, in Revelations we have a full explanation in the sixth chapter, in Revelations chapter 6. You know, I've looked at this scripture many times, 
I've preached on it many times. And the fact is, it still startles me to think about the reality of this. You see, friends, you cannot hide from this event. You may think that you can do something that's going to change the outcome. But Jesus Christ, my friends, is coming again. And you will face that reality. The question is, are you prepared? Notice what it says in chapter 6. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every freedman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Isn't that interesting? I want you to notice something with me. Your status in life, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're bond or free, whether you're powerful or insignificant, this event will happen to all. It will be the kind of cataclysmic, inescapable event that every human being that is still alive and still on the earth will have to face. And what is that? It is the heavens opening. And now to see the Lord Jesus Christ and to see Him as He prepares to pour out His wrath upon the world, this is a daunting picture and one from which you cannot hide. You see, we don't tend to think in our culture today, unfortunately, we have, we, have, we have made God into something that He is not or tried to. Yes, God is love. He is a loving Heavenly Father. And I believe that with all my heart. But if you understand the Scriptures, you will also find out that God holds people accountable and that He is going to hold people accountable. And you cannot escape that accountability. People think today, because they're rich and powerful, because they have accrued to themselves fame or fortune, that somehow they're going to be able to uh, be okay. Do I think of any politicians? I don't know. I, this isn't a political sermon. but the, the, Certainly the political class doesn't think there's any accountability. The rich don't think there's any accountability. But God says, friend, this is something you can't hide from. Jesus Christ is coming again. And if you're not ready, it is going to be a day filled with the most terror that anyone can ever conceive of. Because there's one thing that you never want to do, and that is you do not want to face God in His wrath and in His anger. So, I guess this morning this is a wake-up call for any who will listen. As a Christian, it makes me want to live my life in a way that pleases God. That needs to be on the forefront of my thinking. When I wake up in the morning, and I'm not just telling you this, my heart's cry and my heart's prayer is, God, let me be a blessing today. And let me bring honor to your name. There's no higher calling or purpose in our life than to bring glory to the name of the Lord. And we can't do that ourselves. But as God indwells us, as God powers us, we can live our lives in that way. And oh, how we need that kind of testimony today in our world. But there are so many today who think that they have escaped, that by their power, by their wealth, by whatever means, I want to encourage you today, friend, you cannot hide from Him. No, I thought along the same lines because 
you can't run either. <laughs> we tend to want to run from danger, don't we? You know that old flight and fight mechanism? And uh, I understand that. I mean, there are things that, that can make any of us want to run. Uh, there's no question about it. I, I do like to camp out and I like to sleep in, in a tent outdoors. I'm not a big one for sleeping under the stars, uh, but I don't mind. I like to sleep in a tent and, uh, you know, noise is magnified then. You, you know what I mean? Any of you that like to camp in a, and there's just a, you know, a little canvas. It's not even canvas anymore. A little nylon wall between you and what's outside. And, uh, you know, I've never had a bear come up and, uh, and snuffle around my tent. I know people have, but I've thought I had a bear doing that. Uh, turned out to be maybe a raccoon. But I'll tell you what, my heart was still going, and I wanted to whoo -hoo, head to the car. Ugh. I want to tell you, folks, people just don't want to stop and think about this. But there's so many people today trying to, to run from God. You know, it's been tried before. <laughs> it's been tried before. The story of Jonah is the classic in this area in the Old Testament. And Jonah was a godly man. And I don't care what our reasoning is or what our thoughts are on this. I don't care whether you're a Christian or whether you're not. You cannot run from God. You cannot go from His presence. Jonah, when he realized what God was calling him to do, to go and to minister, to be a prophet to the nation of Nineveh, to the city of Nineveh, it says in verse 3 that he arose and fled from the presence of the Lord. <laughs> That's what he thought he was doing. Didn't end well, did it? No, it's one of my favorite stories. I'm a fisherman. And uh, it, the reason it's one of my favorite stories is because I can just picture it happening. Jonah gets in the ship and the waves and, you know, God's looking down and saying, Jonah, what are you doing? Where do you think you're going to go? And so he sends the great tempest and all of the things happen. And finally, Jonah has to tell the, the mariners what he's doing there. And they're like, oh, what are we going to do? And he says, throw me overboard. No, they didn't want to do that. You know, if you are a sailor who gets money taking passengers, throwing them overboard in the middle of a storm, if that word gets out, you're probably not going to have many repeat customers, are you? No, I don't think so. But they finally had to, and they threw him over, and you know the story. The waters get calm. Uh, how spooky is that? The waters get calm. Now, you, you have to put yourself in Jonah's place. You're out there treading water. Hmm, what happened to all the waves? <laughs> you know? And, you know, today we would hear the, the music of Jaws. Da -da, da -da, you know, he didn't hear that. I don't know what he heard, but he knew that it was not good. And then, I've watched trout take flies lots of times, and I just got to think that's what it looked like, this giant fish. There goes Jonah. Well, God took him to where he needed to get to. It was a tough journey. I don't know what it was like in the belly of the great fish, but I don't want to be there. I've often told Sandy, that's, you know, I fish and I've caught a lot of fish. What a way to go. Ooh. It would be poetic justice, the fish would think anyway. <laughs> Some people want to be cremated and cast to the waters, not me. <laughs> Listen, Jonah got where he was supposed to go. He got there via a fish and some terrible circumstances. And he learned, I think, a lesson that we all could save ourselves a lot of grief in learning, and that is that you can't run from God. You may think that you can. As a believer, you can try it. I know lots of Christians that have tried to run from God. They've tried to hide from His call in their life. How many young people think, well, I know God wants me to do this or that, and yet they think, well, I, I don't really want to do that. How many adults 
God is tugging on their hearts and saying, this is what I want you to do. But you hold back and you think, I can hide from God. I'll just hide out in church. That doesn't work either. In Psalm 139, it says this, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsittings and my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compasses my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. Wow! For there is not a word in my tongue, but Lord, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. Thou hast beset me behind and before. In other words, you're ahead of me and you're behind me. And laid Thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain unto it. Whither shall I go from Thy Spirit? Or whither shall I flee from Thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, Thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, Thou art there. I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Even there shall Thy hand lead me, and Thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, Surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkest hideth not from thee. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. Think of that. You, you cannot run from God. You can't hide from Him. I think we all have to stop in the days in which we're living. And we need to really take inventory of our life. If you have never trusted Christ as your Savior, I don't know why you haven't done that. There are some that perhaps have not heard that Jesus died for their sins on the cross, was buried and rose again. I don't know. It's pretty hard to live in this country and not have heard that. The invitation to be saved is given out over the airways, in written materials, in churches, all across our land today. I can understand those who in parts of the world where the gospel hasn't been preached, but I must be truthful. It's hard for me to understand what's going on in the hearts and minds of a person who lives in this country, who sees what's happening, and instinctively knows that we are living in very, very different and troubling times. And if that doesn't draw your heart and attention to God, I don't know what will. But if you are deluding yourself into thinking that somehow you can run from God, you cannot. No matter where you go, He is there. You know, there's something interesting because I look at my life as a young person and, and I tried to run from God. I mean that literally and fig fig figuratively. I grew up in, the, in church and my dad and mom were in ministry so, as a family, we were in ministry too. And I would sit in the pew. They weren't these nice, comfortable chairs like you have, believe me. More like the old Walnut Street ones when we first went there. Uh, it was a little harder to fall asleep in those chairs, though. I had to admit that. And I remember sitting in those hard benches Sunday after Sunday and hearing my dad preach, and others would come in and preach, and they would talk about the need of salvation. They would talk about the need that every individual must receive it themselves. And I knew in my heart of hearts that I had not, and even as a young person, I had this, this hardness that said, I, I don't want God controlling my life. And I don't know how a young person can have that, but I had it. And I was running from God, right in plain sight. But I'll never forget the night that I got saved. I had struggled with this. I was eight years old. <laughs> Think about that. To, to, to live the first eight years of your life in a church where the gospel was preached over and over and over again, and having not trusted Christ, ooh, that was a hot place to be. I even remember one time they gave the invitation. My dad used to give almost the same. I 
I, that's where I learned how to give an invitation. And he would ask people to pray with him. And then if they prayed, they would say, would you just raise your hand so that I'll be able to know that you did this. And I remember one time that after, after everything was done and, and he was praying, I kind of put my hand up and put it back down <laughs> so nobody could see it. didn't work. <laughs> I felt the same the next Sunday. But finally one night I couldn't sleep. I struggled. I was struggling so hard because I knew. I knew that if I died, I was not ready. I knew that if Jesus Christ came back, I was not ready. I also knew that I couldn't hide and that I couldn't run and that even though others may have thought that I was already a Christian, I'm sure people thought that I was a Christian. Well, maybe not so sure now that I think about how I behave, but that's another story. But the fact is, most people made that assumption of me by the time you're eight years old in a, in a good gospel preaching church, you've responded mostly to the gospel. But I couldn't hide from God. See, what was going on in my heart, God could see me. It's what he says. He says, you've searched me and known me. Folks, listen. When I awoke that night, in the middle of it was early in the morning, actually. The thought that came to my head was so clear. And I'm sure God was speaking to me, not in a voice that I could hear, but it was in a voice that I could clearly understand. And it was, George, what are you fighting? Who are you running from? And this is the thought that brought me to Christ. You're running from a God who loves you and has done everything necessary to save you and wants to bless your life. And it dawned on me at that moment. I didn't want to run anymore. I didn't want to hide anymore. I just wanted to know Jesus Christ as my Savior and to have the peace of God in my heart because that's what was missing. And you see, folks, you know that's the case. The one thing you cannot have is peace with God until first you've made peace with God. God talks about the peace of God which passes all understanding, which shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But you can't have that until you have made your peace with God. And I don't care how long you go to church. I don't know how many churches you attend. I don't care whether you've been baptized or done great things with your life. You will not have that peace in your heart until you have surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. You see, friends, you can't hide from Him and you can't run from Him. And someday, all of us will face Him. And that will be the ultimate challenge. Hebrews 9.27 says, And it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this cometh the judgment. Every one of us someday will stand before God and we will give an account, I believe, primarily of one thing. The account we will give and the answer we will have to give is what have you done with the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ? What have you done with that truth? Revelations Chapter 20 speaks of the great white throne judgment. It speaks of the time when the, the dead, both small and great, will stand before God. And they will give an account before God of the works of their life. And yet we know that the works, no matter how good they are, will not have been good enough. Isaiah cried out that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. All of that self-effort that people have placed into trying to appease God, it will not get it done. Because only what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross will complete that. So friends, just remember, you, you can't hide from Him, you can't run from Him, you will face Him someday. And as I sense the days in which we... I don't know, honestly... I just know this. There are so many of the predictions in the Bible about the return of the Lord Jesus Christ that are being fulfilled every day right in front of our eyes. 
That's the truth that you cannot deny. Things that have never happened before are happening now. You know, <laughs> I, I do follow these things. And one of the things that fascinates me right now is the electronic money. <laughs> yeah, what is it? Who knows? <laughs> I had somebody explain it to me, and I knew less about it after they explained it than I did before. It's a mathematical formulation of some sort or another called BitChain. Is that it? Bit, Bitcoin? Bit, it's some kind of chain. It's a coin, whatever. You see, I'm really, I'm really technical on top of this stuff. But what fascinates me about it is this. The Bible tells us that when the, when the Antichrist takes over the world that you will not be able to buy or sell unless you receive the mark of the beast. Interesting. Well, how are they going to do that if you still have cash around? You know, there's always a black market economy, whether we see it or not. And as long as there's cash, and as long as there are other means by which people can trade, that's going to be difficult to control. But if somehow we go to an electronic money, whew, you will not. And some people would say, well, you don't understand it. It's decentralized. You're right, I don't understand it. I just know this. We've never had it before. And it's gaining popularity. I read an article that says that Bitcoin is being adopted by the world's people faster at a faster rate than the adoption of the internet. In other words, you know, the internet is very popular and, and people have pretty much come to, to accept it and most people have some kind of a relationship with it, whether it's through their phones or through a computer or whatever. Maybe they stream television, whatever. The internet has changed how we do things. And this article went on to say that it took so many, this how many years it took for the internet to really get to this point and the coins are being accepted much faster than the internet even was accepted. Gives me the back of my head, that hair standing up back there. It's just happening, folks. It's just happening. All around us, it's happening. And if you're out there today, or here today, and you're not ready for this, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, His disciples stood there looking into heaven, and the angel said, don't, don't stand here looking. He's coming again. And I believe that with all my heart. And I believe that it could be soon. And I believe that every one of us needs to be ready. Because once he comes, it all changes. It all changes. I realize... When I talk about you can't run and you can't hide, you need to understand why he is pursuing you. As I said, uh, I've never been chased by a bear or an enemy, thankfully, because I never could run very fast. My brother pointed that out to me the other day again. And it was usually me chasing him for some reason, but I'm glad that in a spiritual sense, I could not run God. This is interesting because we realize that people are running from God, but God is pursuing them. But why is God pursuing them? He's pursuing them because He loves them. I can't help but read Romans this morning. Romans chapter 5. <clears throat> Please listen to these words. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. Now think about that for a moment. Christ died for us 
in our sins. We were, we were lost. We were the enemies of God. We were called the ungodly. Without strength, there was nothing in our lives that could allow us to achieve some relationship with God. In verse 7, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. And here it is, folks. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4.10 Here in His love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Hmm. What are you running from? What are you hiding from? What are you trying to escape? God tells you clearly that His pursuit is because He loves you. So much so that He said He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Think about that. That's not how we think. When people cross us or do wrong or they're on the other side of some political fence from us, we're not wishing them well or we're not wanting to do things for them, even if we should. But Jesus Christ came to do the will of the Father. He came to pursue even the lost that they might be saved. Jesus is coming again, friend. And God is in pursuit of your life. And He wants you to trust Him through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to be the payment, the substitute for you on the cross. I think it's so important that everyone in the day in which we are living, I have felt so impassioned that we need to be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Most of us are not bold in that way. We're not, we're not going to stop people on the street <laughs> and say, do you need to be saved? We may witness to those that we know and who ask a question, but the fact is, we really need to be telling people about Jesus Christ because the time of the opportunity could be very short. This salvation can be ours. It can be yours. Christ made it available to all of us. God in His love is pursuing you. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. How much clearer can it be made? In John 1, he tells us, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Verse 12, But to as many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth upon him. That verse so clearly delineates what I'm trying to tell you today. Are you ready? Which side of that equation on you are you on? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Has Jesus Christ, cleansing blood, come into your life, cleansed you and forgiven you, and brought you eternal life? He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. But the wrath of God abideth upon him. Remember that text in Revelations. If you're still here, if you're still alive after the Lord Jesus Christ returns, you're going to enter a period of time of seven years, which is called the tribulation period. It's called that for a reason. Because God's wrath is systematically poured out against the world and against the Antichrist who takes over and usurps the ruling of this world. And you don't want to be a part of the heavens opening and you're realizing your ultimate doom is sealed because you rejected Jesus Christ when He pursued you and you had the opportunity. Knowing Jesus Christ as Savior changes everything, folks. It changes everything. I, uh, I've never been to an air show, 
The closest I ever came to being in an air show was one time I was out in Atlantic City uh, on the bay with a good friend. My boys were along, and we were out there fishing, and it was the day of the Atlantic City Air Show. So there were a lot of jets and planes in the air, and it was kind of neat to see the different ones flying around. And uh, as we were coming in, one of the stealth bombers was getting ready to make his run. And I guess he was going to come in low, you know. And uh, he was coming in right on the floor, it seemed like. I mean, right across the bay. And we saw him coming, and, and I, I just had this feeling in my heart. I'm so glad he's on my side and I'm on his. I cannot imagine what it would be like to have that thing coming down at you in anger and in wrath. It was such a cool experience. I've talked about it before. We were all waving at the guy, hey! And there were a lot of boats and people gathered there. So he decided to put on our own little show for us. As he went by, he took that thing and it went... It was just incredible, like stood on its tail. It was, it was, a, but that wasn't it. And then he got up there and he circled around and it didn't take very long, it seemed. And he came around and he came down. He just came right at us. And I'm like, pull up, pull up, pull up. <laughs> and he, he just blew right over top of us. It gave you goosebumps. That's all I can tell you. Well, friends, listen. That was a neat experience. But nothing like what it's going to be like when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. I don't know which side. I think for believers, I know for believers, it is going to be the most exciting and profound event if we're still alive and the trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ are rise first, the graves open up, God's people from all times are ascending into the clouds and then it says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Oh, that, that's exciting stuff, folks. I know we're living in dark, changing times, and there's diseases. and <sighs> But it's all going to be changed in a moment, Corinthians says, in a twinkling of an eye. Like that. The dead in Christ will rise first. You see, Knowing Christ changes your perspective. An enemy seeing that jet plane diving on them would be trying to hide and, and do whatever necessary to try to avoid what was coming. And I suppose the world is going to be that way. When Jesus Christ returns, they're going to be stammering and trying to figure out a way to tell everybody, well, this is what happened. I think they'll be kind of happy that we're gone. We're kind of a pain to them sometimes, you know. But it's going to be a terrifying event for, for the people of this world who have any understanding at all. Because they will know that they have missed one of life's greatest opportunities. It does change everything, doesn't it? Are you excited that the Lord Jesus Christ come back? Can I get an amen on that? Amen. I am. I don't know if it's going to be in my lifetime or not. I just get more and more excited when I see the things that are happening. And I think it, it may be. It could happen. And believe me, friends, as a Christian, there's, there's just no greater joy that I can have than the idea that, that He's coming again. I, I so look forward to that. You say, well, you, you know, you're getting older. Yeah, that's true. Life isn't quite as easy as you say. Yeah, yeah that's true, you know. I take a step and look behind me to see if my knees came. You know, it's like, oh, did you come along? Oh, you did. You sit very long. Now, you know, I'm trying to be finishing up here because you've been sitting long enough, and when you go to stand up, it's going to be, oh. You, some of you know what I'm talking about. You young people, just forget it. The Bible ends with these words. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. And as it ends, even so, come, 
Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Father, thank you. I'm glad that that you pursued me, that you loved me so much that even as a sinner, you just kept after me and after me until I finally realized that I was running from and hiding from and fighting the very thing that I needed in my life. I needed forgiveness. I needed Jesus Christ to become my Savior. I needed the Holy Spirit of God to indwell me, to bring that peace with God in my heart. And I know there's people that need this in their life. And I'm hoping and praying that they've heard this message today, that they will humble themselves and that they will pray and ask Jesus Christ into their life. To as many as received Him, to them gave He the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. What's that mean? To believe means to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. To seek that forgiveness through repentance in asking Him to come into our lives and to save us. I know, Father, that there are those out there that need this. There may be some here today that need this. And I pray that somehow this word of warning, this challenge to look deep within and make sure of their eternal destiny will find its place in their heart through the power of the Holy Spirit and the power of His Word. I believe Your Word never returns void but accomplishes its purpose. And I know the purpose of this Word today is to challenge men and women, boys and girls, wherever they may be, that now is the day of salvation. Behold, now is the accepted day. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time. And I'm just asking that as we keep our heads bowed and eyes closed, that if there's someone here today that has never trusted Jesus Christ, they just don't have that peace with God, that today they would pray and that they would ask Jesus Christ to be their Savior. And the same for those that are gathered at home. Maybe a friend will share this with them. Maybe a friend will tell them about this message and they'll look at it and God will speak to their hearts. And as it concludes, that they too will join in prayer asking Christ to be their Savior. So wherever you are, whether here or there, won't you join me now in prayer? Simply say, Dear Father in Heaven, you can say that quietly in your heart if you're here. Dear Father in Heaven, right now, I admit that I'm a sinner. And in this moment, I'm asking Jesus Christ to come into my life and save me. I believe that Jesus, the Son of God, died for my sins on the cross, was buried, and rose again. And I ask Him now to be my Savior. Oh, Father, we thank You that there was a time and a day in our life when we prayed that prayer. And so many here today are saying amen to that same truth. And I pray that wherever this is heard, that there will be others who will make that wonderful decision that changes everything. Instead of dreading the coming of the Lord, they'll be anticipating it with great joy. Because we know what awaits us. Whether by death or by life, heaven is ours. It's been secured through the work of your Son on our behalf. We thank you for this now, Lord, and we ask your blessing as we commit this to you in Jesus Christ's most precious name and all God's people said, Amen. Thank you, and, and God bless you, and we'll look forward to seeing you.